good your mercy follows me And I know that you are able So I will be now oh, Come on church, we sing this out together
want you to sing it to him. And how great thou art. And how great thou art. Is then sings my Our souls long for you and cry out for you, our creator. We thank you that you didn't just create us and leave us to our own devices, but instead you had a plan to be in fellowship with us for all eternity. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the plan of salvation. We thank you that we can come into this place and confidently sing that our souls can cry out in confidence today because of the work that you've done for us. Thank you for the love that you have demonstrated. You and you alone are worthy of all of our praise today. God, we love you. Let us stand in awe of you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, good morning, Austin Ridge. My name is Clark Richardson. And if you're new here at the Ridge, welcome. So glad you're here. If you are uh, interested in learning more about what's going on in and through the Ridge, got a couple things for you. First of all, you can scan the QR code in between your seats. So grab your phone out. You can scan that. That gives you all the opportunities that I'm going to be talking about and also ways to get connected to other ministries as well. If you're old school, you can also grab the Connect card in between or actually behind your seat pocket. Um, there's going to be a Connect card there. You can fill it out, drop it in the boxes as you walk out, or you can drop it by the Connections desk in the upper and lower lobbies as well. So be looking for the new here sign, and that will show you where the Connections desk is. We love to put a name and a face uh, for those that are new here. Also, we got two things. we got Belong at the Ridge next Sunday. If you're looking to take that next step and wanting to make Austin Ridge your home, I uh, encourage you to sign up at austinridge.org slash bcbelong. It's a great way to meet other folks that are just like you looking to take that next step, meet folks from the Ridge, and also just learn more about who we are as a church. So you can register there um, for that next week um, on Sunday at 9 a.m. Also, we have our largest campus-wide serve event called Project Mobile Pack. Who last year served at that? Wear the hairnet, all the things. We got any folks? Yes, I see the hands. Awesome. It's our largest one. We'll have 1,500 folks serving both at Bee Cave and Southwest. You can register at austerich.org slash mobile pack, and we're going to be packing 300,000 meals. That's a lot of meals, 300,000. So uh, it's great for families, uh, for children. Invite your neighbor, your coworker, if they want to come learn more about what's going on. It's a great way. It's going to be impacting one of our partnerships in Padere, Uganda specifically. We're going to be uh, packing a lot of meals. Um, and just thank you all for being a part of that. We're raising $89,000 to be able to cover the food costs and materials needed for that. So you can donate and sign up as well at that link. So glad you're here. Before we jump in the sermon, grab your Bibles. We'll be in Acts 7 and enjoy this video. Westlake Bible Church, now Austin Ridge Bible Church. The first Sunday was about 75 people. We rely on God's word, God's truth, and it's not something new, but it's paramount. You know, there's a verse about God going before us and being our rear guard, and he's just gone before us every step of the way, and we have to be obedient to what God wants for our church. People were willing to be real, and that was the message, was are you willing to be real? Are you willing to be honest? I feel like that really set the stage for it is all about Jesus and staying true to his word. To walk with God throughout the entire day and to be more drawn to him so that what we do, we get to do out of freedom and joy because of who we are in him. 
What you see now is a steadfast commitment to the Word of God, a commitment to being dependent on the Spirit of God on daily living, and a commitment to honoring the intention that Christ had from the very beginning of the local church. It's not about Austin Ridge. It is about the kingdom of Christ. How we doing, church? It's good to see you. I want to say good morning to Dripping Springs Southwest campuses as well. Like we said, we're going to be in Acts chapter 7. We've got a lot of verses to cover today. I need you to listen quickly, okay? And I don't know, does anyone here love speaking when you have pollen season? Anybody love that? <laughs> Bear with me. I'm going to pray that everything stays inside where it should stay inside, okay? Um, it is what it is. So let me give you kind of a run-up start to the text. I'm going to go back to two weeks of where we were in the Scriptures. If you go back to chapter 6, the end of 6, verse 13, Stephen is being questioned. 6, 13, and they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will, char- will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Verse 15, and gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Then 7 1, the high priest said, Are these things so? So Stephen starts a sermon. His, his martyrs, what everyone talks about, the stoning of Stephen, but that's only like six verses. We'll see that next week. But his sermon is about 60 verses. It is a long sermon. And so last. Uh, two weeks ago, Stephen brought up Abraham. He brought up Joseph. Now he's going to spend about 30 verses on Moses. The main accusation against Stephen was this man preaches against the law, which means he preaches against the traditions of Moses. So he's going to pontificate on Moses for a while in this sermon. And here's the truth. Israel had already rejected Moses. Israel had already rejected the law. Israel had already rejected the tabernacle, but they believe that's what Stephen's rejecting, and that's what they're accusing him of. So God sends prophets. Prophets in your Bible are people who tell other people this is what God is like. They tell more about God. So Stephen will now show the religious guys how they treated Moses, their priest, and their prophet. And he's going to say this. You didn't like Abraham. You didn't like Joseph. You didn't like Moses, you didn't like the prophets, you didn't like Jesus, and you don't like me. Are you with me? We caught up? All right, verse 17. But as as the time of the promise drew near, what promise is he talking about? There's a promise given Abraham back in Genesis that your seed, your sons, will be like the sand of the seashore. He has an Abrahamic covenant. I'll give you land, seed, and blessing. As the time of that promise drew near, which God had promised, and granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt. They're in Egypt because of a drought. There's water in Egypt. There's food in Egypt. So that's why they are there now. They come as a family, and now they have grown to about 2 million people, history tells us. 600,000 male soldiers, about 2,000 people now are the Jewish people in a foreign nation called Egypt. Now, I'm going to keep you together and give you some hardship. That's what God's going to do with Israel. I'm going to keep you together. I'm going to give you some hardship, and I'm going to prepare you because you're not ready to go into the promised land. Can God remove you from what is good and what is comfortable and put you in a place that is uncomfortable and that you think is not good? And what we're going to see here in this story is the birth pangs of the nation of Israel and why they had to leave Egypt. So look at verse 18 with me. Until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. See, Joseph was the second command of all of Egypt. Now there's a guy in charge, did not remember him at all. Verse 19, he dealt shrewdly, you might want to circle that word, shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. Now, what this sermon is going to do with Moses is going to give you three acts. It's called, I'm going to call it a melodrama, okay? So this is act one. The first 40 years of of Moses' life, we're going to see the second 40 years of Moses' life. We're going to see the third 40 years of Moses' life, 120 years altogether. And what's interesting, whenever you study lessons in your Old Testament, lessons to Israel tend to be lessons to us as well in the New Testament. Lessons in Israel, I'll go a step further, tend to be lessons to the American church of the New Testament as well. Three-act drama series. Now, He started to act shrewdly against the Israelites in Egypt. What does he mean by that? Well, here's what happened. 
the Romans, in, in the book of Romans, God said, I raised up Pharaoh. I raised up Pharaoh, made him great, so that I might demonstrate my power through him to my people that my name may be proclaimed to the whole earth. Can God take a man or a woman, put them in power, raise them up, even a person who says, who is the Lord that I should serve him? And use that person like a child would use a pair of scissors or a pencil to do whatever he wants, however he wants it done, whenever he wants, in the way he wants it done. Pharaoh had forgotten that 400 years earlier, see if this sounds familiar. I'm gonna say that a lot today. See if this sounds familiar. 400 years earlier, Pharaoh had forgotten that a pilgrim group of people had come, settled, brought with them the knowledge of God, and that this great Jewish man who had been raised from the dead, literally from prison, and now he is among the Gentiles, but he's become the bread of life for the Gentiles. Does that sound familiar? Christ is that in the New Testament. This is the picture of Moses in your Old Testament. And is it possible for some people to conjecture that these people who have brought this faith into our land, if we let them grow too prosperous and too successful, then we need to take care of them. Not that they've ever done any harm to us, but we need to stomp them out or else they'll become too powerful. See also United States of America. We were pilgrims. We brought faith to this land. And as the faith came to this land, now all of a sudden, Christians become the enemy, even in the United States of America, even God bless Texas, amen? Even here among Texas, that they can be a problem. Have they ever harmed you? Never harmed us. But if you give them too much power, they'll start forcing their ways on us. This was the first test case in your Bible, in Scripture, of government testing the Abrahamic promise. And here's part of that promise. For they who bless my people, I will bless. For those who curse my people, I will curse. And now Egypt is going to be the first nation to test the Abrahamic covenant. You think that can't happen to God, that those who curse God's people better watch out because God will take a cursing to them as well. And again... This happens even now. Look at verse 19 again. This verse is interesting because I want you to understand what this word means, shrewdly. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose our infants. What's that talking about? So here's the, the plan Pharaoh comes up with. In order to control these people, we're going to tell the midwives whenever a male child is born to take their life away. Kill them. That's an interesting plan, isn't it? Now, does that sound familiar? That a person in power, a Gentile, we're going to see in the New Testament, an Edomite named King Herod says, take all the little boys under the age of two and kill them. This is the first time that happens. It happens again when Jesus is born because a, a son will be born unto you. And that son is going to be the prince of peace, the mighty king of kings. Well, I'll just kill all the boys, and we don't have to worry about this competition and this king being born. He dealt shrewdly with them. So far, these people have not harmed us, but we need to make a plan against them. Commanded their midwives to kill all the males. Is it possible that an entire evil, powerful nation can stand against the Lord and yet be so powerful that God can take a couple of midwives and turn that kingdom upside down through the power of two women who say, no, that's wrong. We're going to practice civil disobedience. We're not going to do what the government's told us to do, and we're not going to kill these little boys. So here's what God's saying. Here's what, here's what um, Stephen's saying. God is in charge, whether it's Pharaoh in charge or a couple of midwives. He can do whatever he wants, however he wants, through whoever he wants to do it. And they're going to do what's right. Are you with me? Look at verse 20. At this time, Moses was born. Now, that little phrase, at this time, you're going to see that throughout this dialogue. Here's the point I want you to get. Your life, just like Moses' life, is on a timer. God knew and picked the time you'd be born. He knows the time you're going to die. He's already picked the time you're going to die. You can drink all the healthy water you want. You're going to die when God wants you to die, <laughs> all right? Your life is on a timer, and Moses' life was on a timer. That's why we see this is Acts 1. And God knows what he's going to do in Acts 3 of Moses' life. Does God know what he's going to do in Acts 3 or 4 of your life? Sure he does. Can he do something in Acts 1 that's preparing you for Acts 3, and you don't have a clue what Acts 3 is going to be about, and yet 
You can get so mad at God in Acts 1 because he's not performing the way you think he should perform and you can just push him aside. Will God still not get to Acts 3 in your life? He can get you to Acts 3 whether you come kicking or screaming or he can take you through the hard lessons. I've heard it say like this, that every behind in the world has a board for it, right? <laughs> I would say this, God has a divine lesson for every saint as well. He's gonna get you to Acts 3. Go ahead and submit in Acts 1, amen? It's, that's why I love we have so many young people there. It's go ahead and follow God now. It's not gonna get easier. It's gonna get harder. Go ahead and do it now. Well, when I get married, I'll settle down, I'll follow God. You think being married to another big fat sinner just like you is gonna make following God easier? <laughs> it's not. So, let's go, I, I digress. <laughs> At this time, Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's sight. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, okay, we've hid this baby for three months. Someone's going to hear this baby crying. Someone's going to find out. They're going door to door looking for babies still. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And he was mighty in his words and deeds. Now, this is not the book of Exodus. This is the book of Acts. So let me fill in a few gaps for you. So what... The mother of Moses decides to do. We cannot continue to hide this child. We do trust God. We trust our child. Hear this, parents. We trust our child to God. This is God's child, not our child. So they, they literally says, the Bible says, it's, it's the modern day wicker. They made a wicker basket and they made it watertight. Can you remember another vessel that people got into that was watertight when the waters of judgment rose in your Old Testament as well? The ark. Here's the little ark with little, not Noah, little Moses in it, three months old. Now, to put him in the mouth, the Bible says, of the Nile. For the Egyptian people, the Nile was the seat of the God of Egypt. They were also worshipers of the sun god Ra, R-A. So Pharaoh has a daughter who worships Ra, if you follow this. She's going down to the Nile where she would bathe. She hears the cry of an infant, mama's. What's the most tender thing and the thing that grabs your heart quicker than anything else other than the, the cry of a child, a three-month-old child? Whether it's yours or not, it grabs your heart. She hears this cry. She finds this little bitty ark, this wicker basket, and finds this beautiful baby inside. She knows this is a Jewish baby. She knows this baby is supposed to be dead. So what does she do? She takes the baby and says, I'm going to raise this child as my own. What we call this, and the Greek word for it is pro-video. We get the English word providence. This is the divine providence, the sovereignty of God. Are you in charge of your life or is God in charge of your life? Can God take this baby and put it in a certain place at a certain time in the Nile, remember Easter, Ethiopian eunuch, and a certain person comes up at a certain moment and that child is there crying and that woman's heart is moved, even though she is the daughter of the sun God of Ra, which Pharaoh was seen as that God and going to take this baby into Pharaoh's house and raise this child as her own. At this time, Moses was born. Folks, there is no coincidences in your life. There is not. That's why as a Christian, you never have to say, good luck. We don't need luck. We have pro video. We have providence. You never have to say, I hope things turn out well. It's going to turn out well. Why? Because we know the one who's in charge of how the things turn out and took this little boy to raise him, named him Moshe, which literally means to depart out. Get this, how powerful God is. This is the might of God. I can take the daughter of the sun god of Egypt, give her a heart, and even have her name the redeemer of Israel from Egypt, the exact name I want her to give him, the providence of God, the might of God. And you think you have a situation this morning that God can't handle? A situation right now that God can't handle, that God doesn't know about. You ever hear someone say, I don't think God knows where I am right now. God can only know where you are at any moment. Yeah, but what if I'm the one who pushed God away? You can't push God away. He pushes mountains and creates Texas Part 2 called Colorado. He creates hills, right? <laughs> you can't push God away. Remember, this is what we were about at the ridge. Ready? Big God, little what? Little man. Big God, little man. And she looks for someone to take care of this baby, the Bible tells us. Now, who do you think she's going to find? A Pharaoh nanny? A Ra nanny? 
She goes and finds a woman, and guess who this woman is? The mother of Moshe. So this woman not only gets to take care of Moses in the pagan household of Pharaoh, she gets to nurse her baby and, get this, they pay her to do it, <laughs> which is also a divine sign of providence that at the end before the departure where they go to the wilderness, Egypt takes all their goods and all this gold and all this money and pays God's people to leave. Again, I say, do you think you have a situation right now that God can't handle. You ready for Acts 2? That's Act 1. You ready for Act 2? All right, we're going to go to verse 23. When he was 40 years old, so now he's 40, he's been raised in Pharaoh's house. He's been educated with the best tutors. He has been raised even in the knowledge of Pharaoh, the king himself. 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. Now, Israel's still there. They're enslaved at this point. They weren't always enslaved. They weren't always. We always see the Moses movies where they're being whipped and being treated as slaves in that way. They weren't always that way. They lived in a place called Goshen. They had it really well for a long time. But now it's turned bad because Pharaoh has forgotten how Joseph was a blessing to the nation. Now they're starting to live in this slavery that is ridiculously painful. And Look what it says. It came into his heart, Moses' heart, to visit his brothers. Who do you think put that in his heart? Was that Moses or was that God? Was that his mom? No. He knew who he was. He knew why he was in Egypt. But God placed in his heart, I don't know if it was a Tuesday at 9.30 a.m., God placed in his heart, let me go see how my kinsmen are doing. Can God do that to your heart? You see, when you walk close to God, God can place whatever he wants anytime he wants in your heart. Call that person. Send a note to that person. Go see that person. Pray for that person. God does these divine encounters with you so you can encounter him on behalf of other people. He puts it in his heart. Verse 24, in seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. Let me ask a question there. Where in verse 24, 25 do you see Moses pray? Do you see him fast? Do you see him ask the Lord before I murder this Egyptian? If I should do this or not, this is what gets us in trouble, folks. He's not talking to God at this moment. He's reacting. As a Christian, we respond to God. We don't react to the world. Moses reacts. He kills this Egyptian. And he thinks, if I take this righteous act and defend my brothers, they will follow me and they'll see me as their redeemer. It's not going to work out that way. Because here's Moses' short-sighted plan. There's three million more Egyptians. He can't kill them all. So he's got to have a bigger God. So the question is, do you want what God can do or do you want what you can do? Because when you react, you're getting what you can do. That's why we as Christians don't ever have to take revenge. Turn them over to God. God's better at revenge than we are. And so Moses takes revenge. Again, this is the beginning of Act 2 in his life. Verse 26, and on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you ruler and a judge over us? Does that phrase sound familiar to you? The same thing by the religious men were said to Jesus, Who made you ruler over us? The Prince of Peace came to Israel to take brothers who could not get along. North Israel, Southern Kingdom, You've got Pharisees, you got Sadducees, you got all these sects. The Prince of Peace comes and says, we are brothers. And just like this, I say to Jesus, who made you ruler over us? Well, when you create the world, you make yourself ruler, right? By whose authority are you doing this? Look at verse 28. And if you're new to the Ridge, this is more verses than we ever cover in a Sunday. But it's one sermon. I, I don't want to mess up Stephen's sermon. Verse 28, do you want to kill me? As you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now, there's a lot packed in those two verses. He's thinking, if I do this righteous act and defend my, my kinsmen, they will say, you're our leader, we'll follow you. They don't do that. Instead, they go the opposite. Who are you to have authority over us? And with that, he leads to a place called Midian, which is on the backside. Go to the wilderness and go to the backside of the wilderness. 
and go to the other side of the mountain range, there's nothing in Midian. He meets a woman named Zipporah. You can go back in Exodus and read more about Zipporah. There were some good things about that. There were some bad things about that. Meets Zipporah. They have two sons. So now you're in Act 2. Now he knows he's called by God to a great thing. Now he's just taking care of sheep, got married, got a mortgage. He's got two kids, got mulch, got to put mulch out. He's got all the, he's got, he's got a drawer with, with chargers in it. He doesn't know where the chargers go. He's got keys on a ring. He has no idea where all the keys go. He, he has a drawer just for instruction manuals. Does this sound familiar? You fall in love with God. A lot of you fell in love with God in college. A lot of you fell in love with God in your early 20s. You started your dating life. As you fall in love with God, you're on fire for God. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Life happens. See, when life happens without God in it, guess what wins? Life wins. And now Moses, for the next 40 years, from the age of 40 to the age of 80, he's just paying the bills and just going about his day and getting the oil changed. He's got his to-do list. And he's kind of not really walking with God the way he needs to be walking with God. But God has Moses. Listen to me. That sounds like Charles Stanley. No Charles Stanley. Listen to me now. Listen to me now. He's got Moses exactly, exactly where he wants him. Does God do his best work when you're full of yourself or when you get crushed? Can God take a person that he's called and have to hurt them and break them to be used greatly? See, Moses isn't useful in act one. Why? Because he's talented. He's strong. He's handsome. He's smart. See, God's got to take that and break it and crumble it up a little bit. He's got to get banged around a little bit with life. He's got to be with Zipporah. He's got to be on the backside of the wilderness for a while. God does his greatest work when you think you're at your strength, even though that's where we tend to think that God doesn't care about us at all. And that's where God is loving us the most. I think God has Moses exactly where he wants him. He's got a timer on his life, as we said. So again, back to verse 30. Now, when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. So now he's 80. He's an older man. Moses is going to live to 120. He's 80 years old. 40 years has passed. Now, for 40 years past, and that's just a phrase. Maybe you found yourself in this situation. I think Moses is sitting in the wilderness going, how did I get here? How did I get in this job? How did I get with this spouse? How did I get these moronic children? How did I get in this situation? How did I get in Austin? When I moved to Texas, I'd never been west of Atlanta. Now, you got to realize in the Carolinas, you guys are foreigners. The Carolinas say, we need a wall right here in South Carolina, right? And you get to a point in your life, you're like, how in the world? And then what, what do you start thinking when you start thinking, how in the world did I get to this place, this is what you start thinking. God, you can't fix this. It's too far. It's too gone. It's too long. It's too much stuff has happened. But the angel of the Lord appeared in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a fire of fire, a flame of fire in a bush. Can God appear anywhere at any time? Any way he chooses to? What you're going to find out about Moses is this. Moses' darkest, lowest moment is when he's in the middle of nowhere standing in front of a burning bush. You're going to find out that Moses' greatest, highest moment is was in the middle of nowhere, crushed, standing in front of a burning bush. Maybe that's your time you're in here today as well. Verse 31, when Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. And as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord. Notice the Lord is capitalized. This is not just an angel. This is the angel of the Lord. This is an epiphany. This is a revelation of God speaking to Moses. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the Isaac, and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Now he's looking at it, and then he hears God's voice. He stops looking at it. Why does he stop looking at it? Because your understanding of your Old Testament is if God ever appears and you look at him, you die. Can you imagine if we Christians had that much honor for God, how our lives would change? That much reverence, that much trembling, not because we're scared of God, we revere him. We respect him. He did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I believe verse 33 is one of the most important verses in your entire Bible. And let me tell you why. Stephen, you dishonor the Lord, you dishonor the temple, you dishonor 
your people, you dishonor the holy place, Jerusalem. Now, how many of you have ever been to Jerusalem? Raise your hand. Ever been to Jerusalem? Raise your hand. A lot of people. Here's the only negative about going to Jerusalem. You ready? You come back and you think you now have a better connection to God than you ever had before. It's kind of like people that go on a short-term mission trip. They want to have a party and show their pictures for hours. No one cares about your trip but you, okay? <laughs> show them three pictures and move on. <laughs> people will go to Jerusalem and say, Brad, I felt something totally different. I know I'm ruffling some feathers here. That's okay. I felt so different. Is God a local God or a God of no locality? God is everywhere all the time. God is just as real in Lake Point, in Senna Hills, in Barton Creek, as he is in Jerusalem. You can't go to a place on earth where God is more present than where you are in the given moment. Okay, so just keep that in mind. There's nothing powerful about a piece of earth. What's powerful is the God who created all things. That's the power, are you with me? And so God looks at Moses and he says, and this is why I understand verse 33 can be misinterpreted in some ways. Take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Now here's what Stephen is saying in this sermon. He's on the backside of Midian, surrounded by Gentiles, married to a Gentile woman. Does this sound familiar? God's chosen son is sent to the Gentiles, marries a Gentile bride to come back to redeem his people for one final time and raises from the dead because no one's seen him for a long time. Picture of Jesus. Now, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. Here's what Stephen is, going to, is saying in the sermon. Guys, whether you're in the temple or whether you're in Midian, God was in Sinai. God was in Midian. God heard the cries of his people in Egypt. God is not localized to Jerusalem. God is not localized even to a group of people. God is the God of all people. Are you following me? This is why Stephen's going to get stoned. Now, he's not saying the temple is not a holy place to, to go to, but here's what he's going to say. And God said the same thing. A man-made house cannot hold God. Solomon said, I'm not sure why he built the tabernacle. I hope God will come, but no man can build something that holds God. God cannot be localized to a building. Now, let's fast forward that to today, how we think about the church building. Now, I grew up, and, and I think there's some positive to this. I grew up having respect and reverence being in church. But sometimes I can think that can also be misguided. Is God as equally concerned about your heart and your car when you're eating lunch by yourself on a Wednesday and how you respect him and honor him as when you walk into a building that a construction company built? You bet. Does God care more about your heart toward him while you're in here versus your outward expression of respect or not? Absolutely. I used to be told going to church, don't run in church. God's house, right? And I always struggle with it, even as a pagan little non-theologically informed little boy. I thought God would be bigger. <laughs> you can't localize God. Now, respect him, tremble before him, but understand this. When you're at work in your cubicle, he is there. You are on holy ground. Here's what he's also, I think he's telling Moses. Take your sandal off. You're standing too tall. I got to shrink you a little bit, Moses. I'm going to have to break you down a little bit. You're still good looking. You're, you're still 40, 80, whatever you are. You're still talented. I got to break you some more. He says, this place is holy. Here's what God's also saying. Now, Moses, you've been on the dark side of the wilderness, married to Zipporah. You've been broken. Now I can use you. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me daily. Now you're ready. Cruc crucify your flesh and follow the Lord. Now you're ready. Lay your life down the altar of God as a, as a sacrifice. Now you're ready. Here's how one author said it. If God is going to use a man greatly, he must first hurt him deeply. Now, why is that a struggle for us? If God, here's our mentality of God in America. If God loves me, he will bless me and prosper me and everything will go well. If God loves me, that cancer will go away. If God loves me, that MRI will not show that terror. If God loves me, fill in the blank. And then all of a sudden, God doesn't perform the way we think he should perform. But when you read your Bible, folks, he doesn't operate that way with anybody in the Bible. Prosperity gospel is not biblical. Here's what God says. If you're going to be my follower, you're going to have to deny yourself. 
Take up your cross. What happens on a cross? You die. How often? Daily. And follow me. And it's going to get, if they hated me, they're going to hate you if you follow me as well. It's going to get harder before it gets easier. Now, Moses, now you're standing on a holy ground because now you are holy. You had heard and seen before, Moses. Do you want what you can do or do you want what I can do? Deny yourself, take up your cross. Do you trust God enough that he can break you? Because here's what the Israelite people do in the wilderness. They always want to go back to their idols. They always want to go back to the comfort, the food of Egypt. They always want to go back. They want to build a golden calf because that makes them feel comfortable. Do we still have idols that we run to? Let me say a few. Money. Some of you look at your accounts every day. And when it's doing well, when it's in the green, it's a good day. When it's in the red, it's a bad day. Is that trusting God or is that trusting money? That's an idol. Some of us won't give because we don't trust God enough to take care of us. So we just don't give thinking, I need to stack all of this up in case something happens. What happens in your life outside the providence of God? No thing. Nothing. Here's, I, got, I got another side of that for you. It's not your money anyway. It's his money. Every dollar you have is because God enabled you to have that dollar, make that dollar, and earn that dollar. And it's his dollar. It's earmarked already when you get it. Your, your prayer should be, God, how do you want to use your money? I know I have to eat. I know I have to have shelter. I know I got to have clothes. I know I got to have transportation to get to where I need to go. Past that, what do you want to do with your own money to build kingdom? Moses, you need to take your shoes off because you're still standing a little tall. What are some other idols? You think kids are idols in this culture? Oh, my gosh. Kids are a blessing of the Lord, the Bible says. The Bible also says they're his. They're not yours. You're a steward of your children just like you're a steward of your money. It's not yours. Those kids are already earmarked. That's why you take your kids and you have to also proverbially put them in the, in the, in the basket and say, all right, God, if they're going to live, if they're going to thrive, it's got to be you. Now, moms, hear me loud on this. Pray like crazy. But here's the best way to enable your kid to have a chance. Be godly. How are you going to be godly? Know your Bibles. Study the word. Pray. Do righteous things and follow the Lord. And when you get to the end, you sit back, you say, they're all yours, God. <laughs> that knucklehead over there, it's going to take some more lashes because he's, he's still tall, standing too tall. You got to knock those sandals out, God. But I'll say this, if you're a mother here today and you've got a child that's walked away from the Lord and it's been decades, your child is not stronger than God. You just keep being faithful. You just trust God. I've seen many people pray to receive Christ on their deathbed. Sometimes I wonder if it's real. A lot of times I know it's real because I've watched them crumble. I've seen the sandals get knocked out right there in that moment. So Stephen's going to say in this sermon, let me interpret what I've said so far. Verse 35, this Moses whom they rejected, who's he talking about? Jewish people who they rejected, who made you a ruler and a judge. This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you, circle this part, a prophet like me from your brothers. Who's that? Stephen's saying, he did. His name was Jesus. And just like Moses, you rejected him, you rejected him. That's why you hate me. Verse 38, this is the one who was in the congregation of the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give us. What that means in verse 38 is God gave him the very words of God. He gave him the law. And God gave us his very words. It came from the mouth of God, from the hand of God. And we rejected those words as well. Because the moment Moses walked down from there, what's, what are they doing? They made a golden calf. Aaron, the priest, who's supposed to be leading the people, I don't know how it happened. I don't know. We just threw all this stuff in a pile, and this calf emerged, and it, it went into the fire, and it came out. I don't know. <laughs> Moses comes down. He's angry. You think God's angry? Absolutely. Here's the word of God, and here's what Stephen's saying. You rejected that word, and you rejected the law. You think the law saves you? You don't even like the law. You don't love the law. You rejected the law. Verse 39, our fathers refused to obey him but thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt. That's the idols. 
saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. That's how we talk to God sometimes, isn't it? I don't know. I don't feel like God cares anymore. I don't care that God's around. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. That little phrase, rejoicing in the works of their hands, it doesn't mean they're like, wow, that's a cool calf. Here's what the Bible basically says in Exodus. They got together, they took their clothes off, and they got immoral together in a big group. I won't use the current word for that. You know what I'm saying? Because here's what happens. When God is not your source of worship, immorality always comes. Always. Look at it historically. Always. You will turn immoral. Something or someone will replace your worship if it's not God. If you're not all on God and he's your idol, if you will, something or someone becomes your idol because all of us were made to worship. God has put that in our hearts. Look at verse 42. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of prophets. Did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your God, Raphan, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond the Babylon. And he has, and he did. Egypt got dispersed. Uh, the, the northern kingdom got taken out 722 by the Assyrians, dispersed. The southern kingdom got taken out 586 B.C. by the Babylonians, dispersed, ex exposed, if, we, if you will, again. The Persians take it over, exposed, dispersed. The Romans take it over, the Greeks take it over, dispersed. And now that's why you see Jewish people in New York City. That's why you see Jewish people in Miami still dispersed. God's still doing the work among the Jewish people, amen? But they're dispersed. They're not back to the homeland yet, even though it became a nation in 1948. All right, you with me? We got a few more verses. Told you we were going to fly. Verse 44, our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers in turn brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David. Now he brings up David's going to bring up Solomon. Why does he bring up David and Solomon? The accusation against Stephen was, you hate the temple. You hate the tabernacle. You hate the law. Stephen says, I don't hate the law. The law shows us we're sinners and brings us to Christ. I don't hate the tabernacle. In the tabernacle, we learn more about who God is, and it brings us to God. What he's saying is, you can't build a home where God lives, where you're the ones in charge, and you control the line of Judah. He's not tame. And you become the chosen people only, even though you have rejected the temple, and you've already rejected the law, and you've already rejected the Lord. Here's what Stephen's saying. You don't love God. Catch this. You hate God. If you love God, here's what Jesus said. If you love me, you will what? Obey me. How do you know someone really loves God? Do they do what the Bible tells them to do? Is there obedience in their life? Obedience is a sign of love. Not proclamation, not words, not outward expressions of worship. It is obedience. So it brings up David and Solomon. Verse 46, who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses. There it is. Made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? Here's what I've learned as I've traveled the world. In nations where the light has turned off, like we talked about Easter in the synagogue, whether it be the Catholic Church in the other nations, whether it be a Methodist Church, a Episcopal Church, when the light is turned off, churches become museums. Beautiful church. You'll see beautiful churches. Go to Spain. Go to Rome. Go to France. Incredible churches in all of Europe. The light is turned off. Why? Because once you take Jesus out of the church, it's just a pretty building. It's just a museum. Where do we go now to see Egyptian museums, what are they called? Pyramids. Where are the pyramids? In sand. Because they cursed God's people and God made a desert out of them. And to this day, it's a desert still. I'm going to close the last three verses. This is, where, this is where Stephen, they're picking rocks up. Next week, you'll see the rocks. Verse 51. You stiff-necked people. Who said that to them as well? Jesus. They just killed him. You stiff-necked people. 
uncircumcised in heart and ears. You make a big deal about circumcision, but spiritual circumcision means your heart is changed. Your ear hears spiritual things. You don't just hear it, you do it. You're uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always, notice Stephen, they said, he always denies the law. He always preaches against the tabernacle. Now Stephen says, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. Then what does he say? So do you. All the people I've been talking about in this sermon, you're the same, just like your dads. You're just like your fathers. Verse 52, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. Who are they talking about? The one that Moses said would come, came, and you killed him. He never did anything wrong to you. You killed him for it. Verse 53, you who received the law was delivered by angels and did not keep it. You don't love the law. You hate the law. You don't love the prophets. You hate the prophets. You didn't love Jesus. You rejected him. You don't like me, and you don't love God. Now, can that tend to rile up some people? <laughs> Not that, hey, I don't feel like some of you are committed to God. It's more like, you guys hate God. I look at your lives, you hate God. That's what Stephen is saying to the religious people of Israel, and he was exactly right. I believe this is a great sermon to the American church. Because what Stephen is also saying is, if you were faithful to your tradition, if you were guided by what your scriptures told you, you would know that God is the God of all people and not just you. And God wants you to be a witness to all the people. But instead, you got arrogant, you got real thick high sandals, and now it's about you. It's not about the God whom you serve. Sounds like a great message to the American church. Are you with me, church? What do you do with this? Here's what I would hope. I need to get broken daily and I need to trust God deeper, and I need to understand that God is everywhere all the time, and he is all-powerful, and there's nothing that my God can't do, and I can trust whatever I'm struggling with right now to him. That's what I want you to get out of this text. And I want you to see big God, little you. Because what he's saying to these men is, you don't love God, you're not willing to bow to God because you've already bowed to yourself. That's exactly what this text teaches. That's exactly what Stephen teaches and if you look at the very next verse, Saul approved of his ex- or chapter eight. Saul approved his ex- ex- execution. Eight one. Look at verse fifty four. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged. There is nothing that gets people more mad that think they're righteous when they're told that they're not righteous. Whoever is willing to tell you that you're not righteous and you have stuff in your life you need to deal with, that's the person who actually truly loves you. And I do. I love you guys. Because we're not ready yet. We're not there yet. We're not holy yet. But God is in process. Amen? And that's why we keep coming back to the word and saying, God, what would you have to teach me today that I need to deal with in my heart? Amen? Let me pray for us. Father, today, we thank you. We love you. We thank you that we can study things that happened so long ago. And gosh, it just puts his finger exactly where we need to be pressed. Lord, I pray that we would always be a church, a people here at Austin Ridge that see big God and little us. Even anything that happens positive at this church is all because of you. We can't change one life here. You have to show up. You have to do the work. And Lord, the fact that this many people are sitting in the room listening to your word tells me that you are at work in incredible ways. Lord, I don't know what circumstances we're dealing with today. But I pray that we take a moment here and just give it to you and trust you because you are the big God, the God of divine providence, and we can trust you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Beginning the month here at Austin Riz, we start the month taking communion. You should have gotten these elements when you came in. If you didn't, if you raise your hand, we've got ushers that are ready to give you these elements. Just raise your hand, keep it high, and they'll make sure you have these so you can take communion with us. I'm going to come back out in a moment. We'll take these elements together. We'll start with the bread. Here's what I want you to take a minute to think about. What situation, what person in my life do I need to trust God with today? Whatever is causing you anxiety, whatever is causing you stress, whatever is causing you turmoil, you need to lay it at the altar today. 
I can't think of a better time or a better place than the communion table to say, God, I got to leave this here. I don't want to take it. I don't want to take it to Monday. I want to leave it here. Think about that for a minute. In a moment, I'll come out and we'll take these together. Lord, before we go decide what to eat for lunch, we need to decide are we going to feast on the bread of life? We're going to decide that we want the living water so that we never thirst again. Jesus, with his men, held up a piece of bread and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. I'm going to die. I'm going to take the bullet so that you don't die when you stand before the Father. That's why you get to live when you see God face to face. He said, take, eat, and remember. He held up a cup and said, this is my blood. This is the new covenant. What this means is you don't have to go through a priest anymore, church. You don't have to go through a denomination. You don't have to go through a church. You don't have to go through an organization. You don't have to go through man-made protocols you get direct access to the throne of God because you're his child. And what's true of him is now true of you, amen? He says, drink and remember. Father, we rejoice. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. It's in your name, amen. Church, let's stand together and sing this truth before we leave. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Come on, we sing. As Jesus paid it all, and all to him I sin had left a crimson stain he washed in light as snow Jesus paid as Jesus paid it all and all to him for sin had left a crimson stain he washed
thank you for the way that you love us, for the way that you've made us new. And we pray that you would send us out of this place on mission, on purpose. And let us see your kingdom come and your will being done this week. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, thanks so much for worshiping with us this week. If you need prayer, we love the opportunity to pray for you here at the front of the stage. And we love you guys. We'll see you all next week.